da 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 Oh, hey guys, it's the VC Andrews Critiquer. Well, I've said it once and I'll say it again. I freaking love the works of Roald Dahl. I already went into detail with my giant peach video as to why, but to paraphrase it for those who haven't seen it, I love their wittiness, creativity, surrealness, and the different kinds of child-hating villains they offer, and I feel the need to do another video about Roald Dahl. Only question is, what? I mean, there were no old versus news left available, I'd already done The Witches, the Nostalgia Critic already did Willy Wonka, and this YouTuber called Headphones UK already did the BFG. But I still really wanted to talk about Roald Dahl, so I decided to do a top insert number here list. But again, what about? Top heroes? No, as you may know from my Witches review, Roald Dahl protagonists are pretty forgettable. Top villains? Not a bad choice, but it's kind of already been done. So then I decided, how about top film climaxes? Yeah, another big flaw with doll novels is that they're usually pretty anticlimactic. I mean, sometimes there's a very brief villain struggle or some sort of danger, but it goes away pretty quickly and the goal of the plot is reached as easy as pie. Thankfully though, most Roald doll adaptations, even the more mediocre ones, usually give us a much more exciting and dramatic climax where the heroes have to confront their foes or past flaws head on, fight with them, and come out triumphant in a much more dignified manner. So, to back up my claim from the Narnia review about how adding to the source material really can be beneficial, I'm going to review the top 8 doll adaptation climaxes that were better than the book. Why top 8? Because there are only 8 adaptations I think do it better. Number 8 SEO Trot This was the last story Doll got published in his lifetime, and you'd be forgiven if you've never heard of it, because it's not what I'd call finishing off with a bang. But it's still a nice little story in its own right, and Dustin Hoffman and Judy Dench bring a lot of charm to the film adaptation with their performances. So what's the scoop? Mr. Hoppy is a meek old guy who lives in an apartment right above his widowed neighbor Mrs. Silver, whom he has the hots for but is too chicken to ask out. She meanwhile only likes him as a friend and instead devotes all her affection to her pet tortoise Alfie, whom she desperately wishes would start growing quicker. Seeing an opportunity to woe her, Mr. Hoppy gives her what he claims is a magic African chant used to make tortoises grow quicker, with words like tortoise grow bigger spelled backwards, because he claims tortoises are very backwards creatures. The gullible Mrs. Silver falls for it, and he secretly swaps Alfie out for a slightly bigger look-alike tortoise after she reads the chant, and swaps that one out for a bigger one the next day, and so on and so on. Okay, so let me tell you how the original story ends. Eventually, Alfie gets too big to fit in his little tortoise house. Mrs. Silver is overjoyed and immediately accepts Mr. Hoppy's marriage proposal. They get married, and that's it. Yeah, he gets away with scamming her. So, apparently the moral of the story is lying will help you win over your significant other in the end. What a great message for kids. Wrong, sir. Wrong. Thankfully, the TV adaptation fixes this by having her find out about his deceit, and the rest plays out like your usual liar-revealed story does. She kicks him out, he mopes around for a bit, she finds a new lover, he realizes he was a jerk and gives all the tortoises he bought as part of his scheme to loving homes, she comes back to him and says, The other guy sucked, you may have lied to me, but you went through a lot to make me happy, I'll marry you. The end. Yeah, it's cliched, but it's still better than the incredibly anticlimactic and poorly influential ending of the original book, hence why it earned a spot on this list albeit at the very bottom. Although on a side note, unlike most liar revealed stories where the person duped is mad at the liar, Mrs. Silver seems more upset over the fact that she actually fell for the whole thing. I mean, sure she's still ticked at Mr. Hoppy, but the first thing she says when she finds out is basically, God, how was I so stupid? Neat spin on the trope. Well, that's all I got for Doll's Average Last Work. Next one. Number 7 
the Witches Zemeckis version. Okay, so if you've seen my old versus new of the Witches, then you know that like a lot of other people, I'm not the biggest fan of the 2020 adaptation. But it's not to say that there aren't some supreme redeeming qualities to it as well, and one of those was having the best final confrontation with the Grand High Witch out of any version of the story. So, like most versions of the story, they've just spiked the soup with the Formula 86 bottle and are waiting for the witches to eat it and have their own plan backfire on them. But suddenly, the Grand High Witch recognizes the Grandmother as a little girl who got away from her years ago, and decides to pop by and sadistically torment her over the fact that her friend Alice Blue was not so lucky. But I got that horrid little friend of yours. Remember? But all of a sudden, the witches start turning rodents. Another thing I like here is that not only do the other witches turn into rats instead of mice, and pretty ugly ones at that, but they actually fight back when the hotel staff try to kill them, just like you'd expect a ratified evil witch to do. But they probably won't win in the end. I mean, they're still super tiny compared to the humans, so it looks like our heroes have won and are about to collect the potions to use for their plan to mousify the rest of the world's witches, when... I did not drink the pea soup. If you recall, I was interrupted. Oh yeah, that's right. Remember the showdown between these two that the Nicholas Rogue adaptation was building up but didn't do much with? Well, that was one of the few legit reasons to make another film version of this story, because the Mechas brings us a pretty damn good one. Sure, it's still mostly verbal, but it's still intense thanks to the great performances of Hathaway and Spencer. But then the kids mousetrap her toes, causing her to scream, then the main boy is flown into the air in a pretty awesome way and sends the bottle right down her throat, mousifying the evil hag and defeating her once and for- Huh? Yes. Again, I love how unlike most versions of the story, where the Grand High Witch is down and out when she's mousified, or ratified in this case, she still puts up a fight and manages to be a legit threat here. At least to the mouse kids. I also like the idea of her cat being the one who kills her as payback for her abuse, good family-friendly alternative to death by a cleaver. Despite the mainly mediocre direction this new version takes, Zemeckis and Del Toro definitely came through in the end with a frickin' awesome climax, topped off with not chickening out of the original book's bittersweet conclusion like Rogue's primarily superior adaptation did. But the reason why it's pretty low on this list is because the climax, while very well done, is still not the most epic in doll history because the connection between the grandmother and the GHW is not especially strong. It's not Zemeckis' fault, the two aren't supposed to have an elaborate relationship with one another, and the climax was executed as well as it could have been in my eyes. I'm just saying, other heroes and villains on our list definitely have more detailed feuds with one another, allowing for a bit more tension. Speaking of which, let's look at one right now. Number 6 James and the Giant Peach Even if there are some parts about it that needed a little work as I detailed in my video about what I would have fixed in this movie, there is still a lot to admire about this climax, so let's take a look at the good stuff. Okay, so what did it improve from the original book? Well, to be fair, there was a little tension in the doll story. The gang arrived in New York by pure chance, but all of a sudden, a plane slices right through the strings of the peach, sending them plummeting down towards their imminent doom, only to be saved just in the nick of time by landing on the pinnacle of the Empire State Building. Then the residents of New York think they're aliens, find out they're friendly, they get rescued, and live happily ever after. Not horrible, but still relatively weak. Now let's look at the film adaptation. The gang arrives in New York just like they had all been dreaming of throughout the whole movie. 
but their excitement is soured when the Rhino, who James was afraid would come after him since the beginning, finally decides to come after him. So yeah, if you remember from my other Giant Peach video, this concept could have been phenomenal if more time was given to explain the concept of the Rhino and its motives, but even with virtually no explanation at all, this is still a pretty awesome encounter. So James decides it's finally time to stand up to his fears, so he sends his friends up into the rigging for their safety while he faces this terrifying abomination from hell head-on. But that's easier said than done. Come out and show your face, you stupid face! <laughs> Thankfully, just when it looks like their Chernabog Rhino stew, James remembers his advice about trying to look at problems another way. The Rhino is pissed at James' contempt for him, but even though it was never clearly established in the movie, conquering his fear seems to finally defeat the Rhino. But not before he strikes a lightning bolt cutting off the peach strings, with his friends still inside of them, so James may have defeated the Rhino, but now is all alone and has no clue what happened to his friends. And to make matters worse, his aunts followed him all the way from England, driving clear across the Atlantic Ocean floor. Again, I went into detail with my other Giant Peach review about how this could have worked, but it's too complicated to paraphrase, so just watch the video itself if you want to know. Anyway, let's look at the scene itself now. Spiker and Sponge try to act all saint-like to convince the police to hand over James and the Peach to them. The officer initially isn't too sure about handing over a little kid to two soaking wet ladies who look like deranged clowns. But once they show him a photo of them standing with the Peach as proof that they own it, and James tries to tell them about his illogical adventures with the equally illogical talking bugs, they win over the citizens of New York. So it looks like James' dream is over, and he's about to go back to being a 1930s Timmy Turner without fairy godparents. No! I'm not! No, in a scene just as awesome as when James stood up to that abomination of a rhino, James tells his abomination of ants that he's sick of all the shit they've put him through for so long, and now that he's made it to New York, they're not going to take that away from him. And I'm never going back with you! Not me, and not Peach. What's really awesome about this is James is portrayed as a very meek character throughout the movie, even by Roald Dahl standards. Paul Terry does bring a lot of cutesy charm to the role to make us care about James, but yeah, he's basically an Ashley Williams for most of the movie, so to see him turn into an Ash Williams in the last 10 minutes is pretty frickin' awesome. But the drama doesn't stop there, as his generally comedic ants take a pretty dark turn as well when they actually try to axe James, and since the police are too busy with crowd control to try and help him, it looks like the kid is subject to Jack Nicholson degree murder. But thankfully, his insect friends rescue him just in the nick of time, allowing for a much much more warranted happily ever after. So again, you might be wondering why this climax is a bit lower on the list. Well again, the Rhino, while scary as hell, doesn't have a very well-defined backstory or relationship with James, so this hampers a bit from the drama. And while James and his aunts have a decent constrained relationship, and it was freaking awesome to see James roast them good and hard, I feel the scene where they try to kill James could have been a little longer. I mean, it's intense, but 10 seconds doesn't leave the strongest impact. Nonetheless, this is still a very well done and dramatic climax where our hero really got to own his foes once and for all. So now let's look at a similar doll ending with a slightly longer villain encounter. Number 5 Matilda before we start, I just want to say kudos to the Nostalgia Critic for finally realizing this is a good movie as he announced in his Danny DeVito review. I knew you'd come to your senses eventually, Doug. Anyway, Miss Trunchable, in my opinion, is the greatest villain doll ever concocted, maybe even the greatest character after Willy Wonka. She's a ruthless, cold-blooded, borderline satanic monster of a woman that will make you never complain about your own principal or teacher again. So let's look at how the movie improved her downfall. After learning from her teacher Miss Honey, who's Miss Trunchable's niece, kind of a spoiler, that her aunt jibbed her out of inheriting her pop's house and money, Matilda decided 
decides to use her telepathic powers to help out her teacher. So, she goes home, practices her powers for a bit, and the next day, when Miss Trunchable is picking on a student while leading a lecture, Matilda uses her telepathic abilities to pose as the ghost of Miss Honey's deceased father, Magnus, saying Miss Trunchable needs to give the house and fortune back to Miss Honey and get the hell out of there or he's coming after her. Miss Trunchable faints from shock and the next day gives into Magnus's demands. Okay, to be fair, it would be pretty hard not to give up so easily if you thought a ghost was threatening you, but it still feels a little too anticlimactic for my liking. So how did the movie fix it? Well, for starters, it made the scene where Matilda's practicing her powers a dance montage. That was a lot of fun. But it also adds a scene where Matilda first tries to use her powers to scare Miss Trunchable at her house and retrieve some of Miss Honey's childhood belongings, and it almost works until Matilda's ribbon blows off and lands in Miss Trunchable's clutches. After putting two and two together, Miss Trunchable is prepared to physically hurt Matilda at school the next day for what she did, before Miss Honey gains enough courage to stand up to her evil aunt. I broke your arm once before, I can do it again, Jenny. I am not seven years old anymore, Aunt Trunchable. <gasps> Not quite as epic as James standing up to his aunts, but still pretty damn awesome. But just when Miss Trunchable is about to get physical with them both, Matilda, like in the book, uses her powers to pretend to be the ghost of Magnus to scare the Trunchable into defeat. And like in the book, she faints from shock and gives in to- <laughs> Nope, it'll take a lot more than ghosts to scare this bitch. But Matilda's not giving up so easy either, as she uses her powers to help her classmates deliver vengeance on the Trunchable. And it takes quite a bit before they finally scare her off, but again, that makes for a much more exciting and worthy villain defeat. But in addition to excitement, the climax also adds some heart as well. In the original book, Matilda finds that her selfish family is preparing to flee the country to avoid the cops who are on to her father's crooked car dealings. Not wanting to leave Miss Honey and her friends, Matilda asks if Miss Honey can be her new guardian. They agree without a second thought, drive off, and Matilda and Miss Honey live happily ever after together. But when Matilda asks them in the movie, they realize, well, mostly her mom, that they were kind of awful parents to their daughter, and she probably would be better off living with Miss Honey, who understands her a lot better than they do. So yeah, it's somewhat of a heartfelt jerk-ass realization moment. Plus, we get a cute montage of Matilda and her new adoptive mother bonding together afterwards. Even though Miss Honey standing up to Miss Trunchable could have been a little longer, we still get a frickin' awesome downfall of this villainess, with fake-out defeats, telepathic ammunition, and even a food fight, making for the sweetest vengeance a kid could dream of. Not to mention a little hard as well. What, still not epic enough for you? Well, our next one will probably be... Number 4 The BFG Animated Version Okay, to be fair, there actually is a semi-decent climax in the original book. The BFG and Sophie have just led the British military to giant country to help capture the other giants. Without any weapons though, since the Queen believes in humanity, so as you can imagine, they're all scared as hell. They succeed in tying up the first eight giants, but wake up the head giant Flesh Lump Eater, who's about to have an early supper of soldiers. Thankfully, the quick-witted Sophie sticks a needle into the Flesh Lump Eater's foot, which the BFG tells him was a poisonous snake. So he says to close his eyes while he pulls out the fangs, ties him up, and mission accomplished. Okay, by Roald Dahl novel standards, this climax is actually not half bad. Clearly Dahl was getting a little practice with writing an exciting finale, and it beats the crap out of the one from the Spielberg film, much as I hate to diss Steven and Disney. But nonetheless, it doesn't even come close in comparison to the one in the animated Cosgrove Hall adaptation, which ironically feels much more like a climax from Steven Spielberg than the actual climax in his adaptation. So, like in the book, the military succeeds in capturing the first state giants, some of which will awake. That's pretty awesome. But just when they're feeling pleased with themselves, they realize they never got the Flesh Lump Eater. Cue Flesh Lump Eater's Godzilla-esque attack on the military. 
The military tries to fend him off, but he's too powerful. So the BFG decides to prove to Sophie that he's not a coward, like she called him after he let the flesh lump eater eat a little boy in his sleep, and finally stands up to the big bully. Sophie, as you can imagine, has some regrets. You're not a coward! I'm sorry. Oh, please come back! But the drama doesn't stop there. The livid FLE demands to know if the BFG did betray him and the other giants like he suspects. The BFG boldly confirms he did because they're evil murderers and he's proud to be more like a human than a giant. But the FLE decides that if the BFG wants to act like a human, then he'll be treated accordingly. Then I kill you. Sophie boldly stands up for her friend, but remembers shortly after that she's a three and a half foot eight year old and he's a 54 foot giant. Not the brightest move, kiddo. So then we get a pretty exciting chase scene of the FLE pursuing Sophie that has a Stanley Kubrick feel in addition to Steven Spielberg. Sophie manages to be stealthy around the intimidating giant for a few minutes before climbing into a mouse hole in the kitchen table. All the while, we see the BFG climbing up into his cave, clearly having some mysterious plan to rescue his friend. But Flesh Lump Eater's not giving up that easily, as he pounds his mighty fist on the table to try and force Sophie out. Sophie does her best to resist, but his force is too strong and succeeds in getting her out. The FLE blocks off the mouse hole and corners Sophie into his clutches, prepared to eat her up. One thing I love about this scene is even though Sophie is still a damsel in distress, she's able to fend off the giant for over five minutes before she's legit screwed. That's just awesome. Also, just imagine being cornered by this thing. This is basically a 54-foot deadite with a sweet tooth for delicate human flesh. See what I mean about this animated kids film starting to feel more like a Spielberg or Stanley Kubrick horror film? This scene scared the crap out of me even more than the Nicholas rogue witches movie as a kid, but thankfully the BFG defeats the Flesh Lump Eater by giving him a nightmare about the one thing giants are scared of. Jack is the only thing giants is frightened of. He's a famous and terrible giant killer. <laughs> He doesn't have a beanstalk, does he? Oh, yes, he does. You know about him, too? Oh, I was very scared of meeting him one day. <laughs> well, you mean me. <laughs> huh? On a side note, the BFG did still do this at one point in the original book, but just as a prank. But I think that saving this for how they defeat this dude and rescue Sophie was ingenious. What better way to conquer something like this than with their one true fear? But like with Matilda, there's also some emotion at the end. In the book, the BFG and Sophie live on Earth together as celebrities in the Queen's Palace. But in the animated film, the BFG politely declines the offer since he wants to continue his job giving good dreams to children. But after a tearful goodbye, Sophie decides that life in a fancy palace means nothing to her without the BFG and insists that she go back with him. This was a nice way to show how great of a bond these two had developed by having Sophie choose her friend over riches. On a side note, she actually chooses to stay in Buckingham Palace while the BFG goes back to Giant Country in the Disney film. So much for good chemistry between these two. While one of the more faithful doll adaptations and the only one that earned his approval, this film still gave us an exciting, suspenseful, and heartfelt finale that's among the best in doll adaptation history. But who says a climax can also have some humor as well as drama? Well, our next film sure doesn't. Let's take a look. Number 3. Fantastic Mr. Fox. What's funny is, I almost wasn't going to put this on the list, not because I dislike the movie, on the contrary, this is one of my favorite doll adaptations ever. I just figured, seeing how the rest of the story was greatly altered and expanded from the original book, it didn't quite fall under the same territory as other doll adaptations with their endings altered, but I eventually felt this finale was just too good to not include on the list and figured, who gives a crap about the length? Anyway, let's start by looking at the book's ending. 
Mr. Fox and his family are still hiding underground from the wrath of farmers Boggus, Bunce, and Bean, who want vengeance on him for constantly stealing their poultry. Unable to cope with starvation any longer, Mr. Fox decides to simply burrow to each farmer's place and steal everything they have, roping in the other forest animals affected by the farmer's siege along the way. And it's smooth sailing. Aside from a brief encounter with the housekeeper and a rat and bean cider cellar, they have a huge feast and live happily ever after off the food, while the three farmers wait outside the sewer manhole for them to come out for the rest of their lives. Boring! Couldn't agree more, Homer. The movie's climax, however, is awesome on so many levels and very hard to paraphrase, but I'll do my best. Just when the animals are about to have their feast of the stolen food, the farmers nearly drown them by flooding the sewer with cider. And to make matters worse, they've caught Mr. Fox's prodigy nephew Christopherson when he and his sullen son Ash try to steal back Mr. Fox's tail. Realizing he's really screwed over his loved ones with his criminal ways, Mr. Fox initially decides to turn himself in, even having a pretty emotional conversation with Mrs. Fox about how he's always felt he has to take risks to prove his worth to his peers and feel satisfied in life, but that in hindsight, it probably wasn't the best self-esteem building tactic, and it's topped off by this. I love you too, but I shouldn't have married you. But after rescuing his son Ash from the rat in the cider cellar who wants vengeance, and we get a somewhat emotional death scene where we find out the rat just wanted cider this whole time, he decides to replace his suicide mission with a go-for-broke rescue mission. But first he opts to give a genuine toast complimenting all his friends as compensation for the self-praising and belittling toast he was giving at their feast before the flood came. There's been quite a bit of drama and heart so far, hasn't there? So when does the funny stuff start? right when he starts assigning everyone code names. Here are a few standout examples. Weasel! Mustela Navarra! Stop yelling! Uh, all right! Ha! Woohoo! All right, Ash, you get these little kids organized and put together some kind of KP unit or something to keep this sewer clean. It's good for morale. Done. What's KP? Um, I think it means janitors. Hey, hey, me, y'all over here, hey. I want to go with you too. I want to fight. Good, fabulous, Micratus Pennsylvanicus. <laughs> Wait, I, I, I didn't get a job yet, or a Latin name. What's my strength? Listen, you're Kylie. You're an unbelievably nice guy. Your job is really just to be available, I think. I don't know your Latin name. I doubt they even had opossums in ancient Rome. But the fun doesn't stop there. After pretending to surrender himself to the farmers for letting Christofferson go, and knowing damn well that they're not going to keep their word, he bombards them and their minions with fiery pine cones, all while the local children sing that funny playground song they wrote about them. Then Mr. Fox, his sidekick Kylie, and Ash go to rescue Christofferson. First, we get another heartwarming scene where Ash admits that he was a huge asshole to Christofferson. I'm rescuing you. I've got mixed feelings about that. I don't blame you. Then Christofferson gives Ash a karate lesson to break him out with mixed results, while Mr. Fox tries to calm down the rabid security guard dog at Bean's factory, again with mixed results to say the least. But just when they think they're home free, they find the farmers and minions are standing by the exit waiting for them. Mr. Fox gives Bean a cold reason you suck speech and tries to steal back his tail, but finds there's just too many guards to get past. But thankfully, Ash uses his small size to dodge the bullets while also using the spiritual techniques of Christofferson to set the dogs on the farmers and get back his dad's tail. Well, kind of but still a nice way to show Ash's character developments. So how does the movie resolve the animal's lack of food problem in the sewer? Simple, they find a grocery store right above them to steal food from. But don't worry, it belongs to the farmers, so it's okay. And it's all topped off with the news that Mrs. Fox is having another baby and a fun dance montage. We've had a lot of great finales on our list so far, haven't we? but sometimes the best finales don't need any action at all as long as the emotion and drama is sufficient. So let me demonstrate that for you now. Number 2 Charlie and the Chocolate Factory 
What really sucks is, even though the story is Roald Dahl's magnum opus, it probably has the weakest climax of any story he ever wrote. So, I guess I should show you what I mean. So after the incident with Mike in the TV room and Wonka finds that Charlie is the last kid standing, he declares that he's the winner. Well, that sure had a lot of build-up. So he drags Charlie and Grandpa Joe into the Great Glass Elevator, they go out and we see that the bratty kids did end up surviving. So much for the cautionary tale aspect. Then Wonka tells Charlie that he can't go on forever and needs an heir to leave his factory to when he retires, and the Golden Ticket Contest was a way for him to find just that, which Charlie has won the honor of by being the last kid standing. Then they go to pick up the rest of Charlie's family and fly off into the subpar sequel. The end. So yeah, I can't help but wonder if Roald Dahl's editor had this to say to him after he read it. Congratulations, Borax. You've discovered a cure for insomnia. But as luck would have it, both film adaptations of this story give us the best climaxes of any Roald Dahl adaptation thus far. And what's really awesome is, they do it without any action, danger, or straightforward villain. And yet, there's still so much heart and drama in both of them. But they are certainly different, though, and I ultimately feel the 71 film's take is a little more effective. So yeah, the Wonka version is going to be my number one pick, but let's be honest, you all saw that coming. But one thing at a time, of course. So like most other people, I think Burns' adaptation of the story is decent, but a great example of how staying closer to the source material won't always make for the better movie. But the one thing almost everyone agrees was the best part of the movie was... Willy Wonka! Willy Wonka! Okay, the second best thing was Willy Wonka's origin story. Wonka seems a lot more insecure and childish here than in most versions, but there's actually a pretty logical and tragic reason as to why. When he was a kid, he always wanted to try candy, but his pop, being an acclaimed dentist, would never let him near the stuff. He eventually started sneaking candy on the side, and it was love at first taste. But when he came out of the closet to his dad and said he wanted to be a candy maker, his pop wouldn't hear of it. No son of mine is going to be a chocolate. Yeah. Wonka then declares he's running away to pursue a candy career in Switzerland if his pop won't accept him as a chocolate lover. But his dad warns him that I won't be here when you come back. So, as you can imagine, being a kid, Wonka doesn't get very far on his journey to the Alps, and sure enough, he finds not only is his father gone, but his whole house is as well. Hey, if Spiker and Sponge can drive underwater in the Roald Dahl universe, then it's perfectly plausible. One thing I love about Wonka's backstory here is, not only does it make him more sympathetic, but it also makes him so relatable. So many other people, such as gay and interracial lovers, have experienced similar discrimination and rejection from their parents in their lifetime, which has had pretty bad psychological effects on them, a lot like with Wonka. Anyway, let's look at the climax now. At first, it plays out like the shitty one in the book, where Wonka declares Charlie's one by being the only kid left, we see the other kid survive, Wonka anoints Charlie as heir, but then Charlie asks if his family can come to the factory too. Oh my dear boy, of course they can't. You can't run a chocolate factory with a family hanging over you like an old dead goose. Of course Wonka looks like an asshole at Charlie, but the audience knows why he has this mindset and can't comprehend why Charlie won't abandon his family to live in the factory. But when his life and candy sales start deteriorating from depression while Charlie's life improves, he starts to wonder if maybe he should try to reconnect with his pop to be happier in life. Again, like so many kids rejected by their parents do. Charlie offers to go with him, and we find that not only does his father regret what he did, but is overjoyed the minute he realizes who he's speaking to. And you haven't flossed. Not once. So now that his childhood trauma is resolved, Wonka allows Charlie's family to come to the factory as well, and they live happily ever after. This was a great finale, with great character development, and a great lesson about how the stress and trauma you have from rejection will never be resolved if you never make an effort to resolve it. And if you do, you may be pleasantly surprised. So now let's look at the great climax of the other adaptation of this story. So even though I don't need to say it, the number one doll adaptation climax is... 
Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Not only is this the greatest climax of any Roald Dahl adaptation, but it's also one of, if not the greatest climaxes in movie history. There's just so much to this finale that works. The acting, the tension, the pathos, and best of all, the heart it all leads up to. I know I don't need to paraphrase it for you, but I'd look lazy if I didn't, so here you go. Around the middle of the tour, Wonka introduces the group to a product called Fizzy Lifting Drinks, a soda that makes you fly. The guests naturally want to try it, but Wonka says no, it's still too powerful and he can't have kids flying all over his factory. But Charlie and Grandpa Joe sneak some when the others have left, almost get chopped by the ceiling fan from their inability to stop going up, but are able to safely get back down by burping the stuff out and rejoin Wonka, who seems unaware of the incident. But then when they're the only ones left, and it should be time for them to be awarded their lifetime supply of chocolate, Wonka just assures them unconvincingly that the other kids will be fine, shows them the way out, and heads to his office without awarding them even a chocolate kiss. So when Grandpa Joe goes to ask Wonka what gives, Wonka reveals he's omniscient and knows damn well that they stole the fizzy lifting drinks, and it turns out the fine print of the contract they signed at the beginning contained a clause that said their rights to the grand prize would be nullified if they broke any rules during the tour. So because of this, and the fact that Wonka now has to pay to clean the ceiling they contaminated, You get nothing! You lose! Good day, sir! Okay, so first let's talk about the most obvious strength, the acting. It is a tragedy that Wilder did not win the Academy Award for Best Actor with this performance, because the fury he displays here is so convincing and bone-chilling, I think it makes the tunnel scene look like it's a small world after all. Just look at these faces. Really look at them. These are straight out of a nightmare. The only other actor I have ever seen display fury that intense and believable was J.K. Simmons in Whiplash. This also helped with Jack Albertson and Peter Ostrom's performances. Apparently director Mel Stewart didn't let Wilder go hog wild in rehearsals so that when he did in the final take, their shocked expressions would be real. But this scene really does warrant such powerful acting, which brings me to my second point, the context. Let's first look at this scenario from Wonka's perspective. You have to realize that Wonka wasn't just upset about them taking the sodas, or even at them for that matter. Throughout his life, Wonka had been let down by pretty much everyone. His own employees betrayed him by selling his recipes to his competitors, which is why he hadn't been able to let anyone in his factory for so long, and now every single one of his guests had broken rules and wasn't worthy to be his heir. So Wonka was heartbroken because he felt nobody truly cared about him, just his candy, and he was taking his anger at the world that had been building up for so long out on Charlie and Grandpa Joe because they were the only people around for him to tragic, isn't it? But it's also pretty tragic from Charlie's perspective. He also had a very crappy life, being poverty-stricken and constantly have life wave good luck in front of him like a ball of string for a kitten and say, nah, 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 nah. And now when it looked like he'd finally been thrown a bone, fate not only said, psych, but now he had to be ripped to shreds by the person he admired most in the whole world. Regardless of the fact that he did break the rules, that is just tragic. And of course, it leads up to his iconic morality debate. Should he sell the gobstopper to Slugworth, get revenge on Wonka, and have enough money to buy chocolate for the rest of his life? Or should he return the gobstopper to Wonka, which won't get him any money or chocolate, but will show he's legitimately sorry for stealing the sodas and might restore his hero's respect for him. He ultimately chooses the latter, and after Wonka says a line that perfectly captures his surprise and joy that for the first time in his life, someone legitimately cared more about him personally than just his candy or status. So shines a good deed in a weary world. He instantly forgives Charlie for his rule-breaking and reveals that the Slugworth who made him the offer was actually one of his old workers, helping Wonka test each contestant's morality and loyalty to him as a person, and Charlie has redeemed himself by passing that test. So after all that drama and gut-wrenching, doesn't the scene where Wonka tells Charlie he's won the factory feel so much more meaningful? 
I thought so. I think the reason I like this climax a little more than the one from the Burton film is because here it's not just Wonka who's completely crushed and has to have their faith in humanity restored. It's Charlie as well, so it works better if this happens to both our leads instead of just one of them. Before I finish, I just want to say two more things. One, sorry to disappoint some Grandpa Joe haters, but I'm not gonna roast the guy in this review. He had some prick qualities, sure, but he also had a lot of redeeming qualities that people overlook. Two, another reason I like this climax better is because it has Wonka revealing what happened to the man who suddenly got everything he always wanted. What happened? He lived happily ever after. Well, that's all I got. But before I sign off, I just want to give a shout out to another great YouTuber and an old friend of mine, Murray Reactions, whom I recently guest starred with on his Nostalgia Critic Wonder Woman review. The guy gives some pretty damn funny reactions to popular YouTube videos like Nostalgia Critic, Scribble Juice, Fan Theories. He's even reacted to a lot of my videos, which has helped me gain notoriety on YouTube, so I thought I'd return the favor. So if you haven't heard of him yet, check him out. Okay. Okay, one more thing before I go. A lot of you may be wondering what's next for me. Well, I'm trying to decide between doing an old versus new of Of Mice and Men and The Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil Lee Frankweiler. But before I do that, a lot of you may remember my top 10 episodes of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids review. The reason I'm bringing that up is because I've just recently seen another episode that's become one of my new favorites and I really want to talk about it. So, hopefully next week, I'll be doing a mini-review of that episode. So what's the premise? For now, I'll just say, Think about a yellow submarine, And also glorious Soviet Mother Russia. Alright, well, I gotta get prepared for it. You know what Wonka says. Time is a precious thing. Never waste it.